Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sunday's Walk in the Park. Just waiting for the YouTube live to come on to make sure I've got audio. The YouTube. And I do. Good. That sounds loud. So big thank you all for being here. This is the segment where we answer the top questions on your minds of the week. And uh, some of the questions have become very, very deep considering where we are in the market. Everybody has time during the flatness of Bitcoin, etc. to look at other stuff. So let's jump in. And as always, this is edutainment, never financial advice. And where the questions come from, they come from Patreon. So big thank you to the community. I love being in there every day with you all. And uh, I live for this, literally. So first question is from Banks Folded. What happens to Bitcoin prices during monetary deflation? And of course, monetary deflation is something that... A lot of people talk about and think are kind of happening, but let's talk about it. And first of all, deflation is the worst case scenario. So what we mean by that is for deflation to actually happen, the Fed would have to stop money printing, and that isn't going to happen. However, we can theorize as to what would happen in such a scenario. First off, the US would have to default on its debts. And the interest on its debts is already as high as tax revenues. In fact, it's about to hit a trillion dollars, which is far in excess of the US defense budget, which is what I call shooting themselves in the foot. Now, if the Fed stops printing, the US would immediately become insolvent and go bankrupt. Our debt-based system is dependent on money printing. And it's what's killing us, but it's also what's keeping us alive. And that's the irony of this thing. It's like a machine that keeps on needing oxygen to breathe. So further, economists theorize that we would enter into a deflationary death spiral. And this is where there is a general contraction in the economy due to the rising cost of servicing debt. And this would lead to a collapse of aggregate demand and a drop in spending so severe that producers must cut prices on an ongoing basis in order to find buyers. And this would cause deflationary recession, mass unemployment, the implosion of the financial system, not to mention the US government defaulting on its debt. And for example, suppose, this is kind of tough to wrap your head around, but suppose the government stops the money printer, causes a deflation of 10% per year. If the government is borrowing money at nominal interest rate of, say, 0%, it actually faces a 10% real cost of borrowing because it's actually going up. This means that every year that passes that the debt gets compounded by 10%. We'll talk more about compounding later. And very quickly, the government would become bankrupt. Now, in this scenario, the dollar would collapse and Bitcoin's price would effectively go to infinity since the dollars would be worth zero. And I suspect we would probably have to price things in Bitcoin or some other nom denomination of value. And this is why we would rather have hyperinflation, because this way the cost of borrowing is low and the economy can still run. The alternative is not good. And that's why everybody is so afraid of deflation. That's why you have people like Elon Musk, Kathy Wood, etc., hitting the alarm bells uh-uh. Hey, Fed, wake up. Deflation is bad. And a quick reminder, ladies and gentlemen, unfunded liabilities. Check this out. I posted this, I think, last week. $172 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Who's going to pay for that? And that is the money printer. So there you are. So don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. Uh, it may happen for a blip of time, but it cannot be a consistent situation. So next question is from the Slayer. I am 65% Solana, 28 years old, and I'm scared of worst case scenario and it crashes. Would you recommend to swap some, for example, 20% for Bitcoin by selling at a 10% loss now, or is it not that risky? So first of all, let's take a quick look at this simple little chart and it puts everything in perspective. With any asset, the higher the risk, the higher the return. And if you want to get alpha, you do have to take on some risk as you go forward. And what I did was I put this chart and I overlaid a couple of assets on it that might be familiar to you. So in terms of my perspective of the assets, we've got Bitcoin, it's the lowest risk, lowest return, hardest asset on earth. I think everybody needs some. Not shelling it, not pumping it, just stating a fact. 
it is programmed to not be inflationary like many other assets, but only slightly inflationary. And at the rate at which people are losing their keys and their coins, it's actually deflationary. Second up the chart is Ethereum. You can see a little more risky than Bitcoin and also generates a little bit more return. Like I always think of things in terms of tripling, quintupling, and then septupling. So it's a kind of three, five, seven is how I see these returns happen for these different assets over time. So if Bitcoin triples, Ethereum will quintuple and Solana will go up sevenfold. But Solana has more risk than Ethereum and a lot more risk than Bitcoin. But everybody, it's important to have a mix of these different assets as we go forward. So what I shared as well a week or so ago is what it would mean to these assets if they went back halfway to all-time highs. In case you missed it, quick reminder again, the Bitcoin, Bit, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin all-time high price is 68.672, Ethereum is 4860, and Solana is 259. Uh, it's hard to believe that we were there not too long ago. And getting halfway back would re result in a return on investment of 79%, for Bitcoin, 85% for Ethereum and 362% for Solana. And those prices are slightly out of date because that charts from last week, but you get the idea of where we're coming from with this. And what I like to recommend or not recommend was what I actually do though, not financial advice. My crypto looks something like this in these ranges. So currently I'm approximately 80% Bitcoin and nearly 10% Sol, 10% Ethereum. And I like to have a high focus on few assets so I can swap in between and manage risk carefully. But it could vary as they go up in value, that'll quickly become 70% Bitcoin and you know about 15% Ethereum and a 15% Sol. And that's how I plan to manage my ranges as I go forward. I think you're way too heavy in Solana. Having all your eggs in one basket is always extremely dangerous. And in fact, you could argue me having 80% Bitcoin is also dangerous and above 80% Tesla is also dangerous in my equity portfolio, but I can afford to take the risk. When you can't afford to take as much risk, diversify a little bit more in case one of these asset classes blows up uh, for protection. So hope that helps. Uh, next question is from Nothing Burger. If it's true that Sam Bankman Freed is actually the Sith Lord and points to the Death Star at crypto, shouldn't we all just flip our Bitcoin and ETH into FTX and Solana as they are going to be the only survivors? So interesting. I had to do a little Google search and find out what a Sith Lord is. And I found out it looks like a bad guy. I don't know too much about it. Didn't dig too much. But you have the Sith Lord on the left and the Beanbag Lord on the right. That is Sam Bankman Freed. And I don't know much about Sith Lords, but I do know SBF is the son of public spirited law professors at Stanford. He believes in what's called the Benthamite ideal of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Uh, for example, not about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, he looked at factory farming and he was so shocked at how animals are treated. He became a vegan overnight, essentially. He also studied effective altruism the movement offshoot with the credo earning to give, which promotes pursuing a lucrative career in order to have money to give away. And after graduating from MIT, he became a quant at the trading firm Jane Street Capital that taught him how to trade. He left. Then he focused on working with organizations de devoted to animal welfare. Um, and then after that, he worked with the Center for Effective Altruism in the UK and he became a full-time investor in crypto and he started FTX in 2018. He also uh, donates to Democrats out there. And I know people might not like that or they might like it depending on which side of the fence you are. I personally don't care. Um, but I do believe his end game is to do the max amount of good for the max amount of people. And it sounds extremely altruistic, but considering his background, it's very clear either he is a master scammer and we've all discovered who the master scammer is but i don't think he's that way and in addition this is an old saying from sayed samilaya and that is no matter how rampant the evil at the end only the good will survive and i do believe in that and and a quick refresher for those who do not know what the benthamite ideal is that is from jeremy bentham so read up on it fascinating uh, situation and story to look into 
Now, quickly, let's look at the Sam Bankman Freed empire. Remember, he built all this in less than five years and he became the biggest, wealthiest under 30 person on earth. And he's also self made. And in that short window of time, it's kind of staggering. So he is a smart cookie and he does have a pretty vast empire. And this is what scares some people. Also, the fact that he's working closely with politicians, spends a lot of time in DC, is crafting legislature to help make the crypto world a better place, make it accepted because he knows it's better for everybody. The future is kind of crypto, blockchain, etc. But before I wrap up, uh, I don't think Sam is evil. Uh, there may be some things that happen within the FTX empire that may be a little bit untoward. I'm not sure. I can't prove that. But I know these two are pretty close. And this news just came out. Uh, people talk a lot about Sam Bankman Freed, etc., particularly in the US. But I'm not sure why he's getting all the attention. The news release just came out with a big thank you to Sanjay for sharing with me, literally right before I streamed. He said, CZ said, Kazakhstan is going to build a new central bank digital currency on the Binance chain. Okay, <laughs> repeat that. They're going to build their CBDC on CZ's Binance chain. And uh, I can't remember the name of the actual currency. It escapes me right now what they're going to call it. Something beginning with L, I think. Um, but anyway, L or T. But that's the future of Kazakhstan. And of course, Kazakhstan is a pretty crypto-friendly country. They do a lot of Bitcoin mining there. Um, and at the same time, they will be deploying a central bank digital currency. So as we said a million times, CBDCs are coming. We'll talk more about that at the very end as well. We'll talk about gold as well and CBDCs. So thank you for that question. Next question is from Benio. In light of a sure recession, aren't risk assets going to keep going down even if the Fed pivots earlier than they say they plan to? So as we discovered, uh, actually, a lot of the stories this week all intertwine together. So make sure you watch from beginning to end and you'll see how the connective tissue in the very last slide that I do talks about everything that we're going through and how, in my mind, it's kind of crazy. So first of all, the average recession duration is 10.3 months. And we have analyzed uh, all the recessions it's going back to 1950. There's about 11 of them or 12 can't remember exactly. And the recessions have persisted between two and 18 months with the average spanning about 10.3 months. Now you could argue, are we in one? Are we out of one? Looking at all the stuff that I look at, we're definitely in one, but the government officials just don't know it yet. So, and we've been in it for at least two quarters. So, you know, depending on if, if it is an average recession, we're going to be out of it before we know it, which is the good news. Let's talk about a couple of other factors that are historic data points that you all need to know. And that's why, uh, you know, I jumped in with both feet at 3,500. Um, so first of all, when, when do stocks bottom during a recession? The answer is they don't. Often <laughs> stocks bottom before an official recession is called. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people are waiting for the recession to be over before they jump into the stock market. That is historically not a good strategy. And typically, a third the way through the recession is when the market bottoms. So I'll zoom out for a second. Do the math. If we're two quarters in or two and a half or three quarters in, and the average recession duration is 10.3 months, we are way past a third of the way through the recession for the market to bottom. But I'll show you a chart in a second as well. Remember, markets are forward looking. And again, since 1950, the average decline for the S&P 500, again, is about 29% exactly. 29%. Why is that number important? Well, let's look at this little chart. So the top of the S&P 500 was 4,818. 4, the bottom was 3,491, which we hit only a few days ago. A perfect wick. And that's when uh, <laughs> basically, uh, anyway, I won't talk about that. But look at the percentage of that. It is down 27.52% in that time frame. So historically speaking, average top to bottom for a recessionary situation, 29%. We hit 27.52%, which is pretty darn close. That's a good enough indicator for me that, that the 3,500 was a bottom. The 3,500 was also a level that I knew that big money was going to deploy at. So maybe a little bit of a cheat code there that I had, but I also shared everything with you for many, many weeks now. So let's look at another key point as well. And this is the S&P, uh, that should be S, 
the S&P 500 PE is right now at about 15.9. Now, the obviously the Fed monetary policy, don't fight the Fed, hiking, etc., has left its mark on equity valuations. It has been crushed, and we're now down around 15. I drew a red line on this chart, which comes from Jurian Trimmer from Fidelity. And you can see here, rarely, very rarely, does the S&P 500 trade at a PE of 15. Even though we're going into a recession, the markets are forward-looking, and they've all re-ratcheted kind of pricing and PE valuations. In fact, I believe many stocks are completely oversold, despite the fact we're going into a recession. So... And again, it's rare that the market is this cheap, and I consider it a generational buying opportunity. So there you go. That's just, again, history, data. Make what you want of it. So next question is from Joe One. Uh, you are a big proponent of the three-legged stool, crypto, real estate, and equities. My wealth consists of being a whole coiner and owning a paid-off house. Would you go hard into equities, keep stacking Bitcoin, and buy a second home for rental? interesting one so i do believe it's good to have the my my diversification is those that three-legged stool that i've been talking about since i began this channel because that's how that's everything i did you know you've all heard the story a million times but let's pull out a little example first of all i want to say something which is not financial advice but i never pay off mortgages let me run through a simple scenario as to why one it's tax deductible for most people two if you can borrow at 5% and I, all of my mortgages are under 3% or at 3% or very close to 3% and I have a number of mortgages, uh, why don't you want to borrow at, and I chose a 5% rate because it's kind of the average for the year so far in 2022, but why not borrow at 5% when the um, stuff you're borrowing, which is fiat, is debasing at 14% on average and you have extra cash to arbitrage invest as you go forward. Again, if you can get a higher return on your money, it's a game changer. And I'll, I'll give you another example of how that is the case in a minute. But here, mortgage scenarios, if you have, say, a half a million dollar home um, and it's fully mortgaged, you got zero mortgage, that is an opportunity cost. Your cash is locked up and it's not earning market returns. It's all in your real estate. And real estate will go up but not as fast as the markets. Next scenario, you have a 15-year mortgage, 500,000. Your mortgage payment is 39.54 a month. Your interest over the mortgage of 15 years is 711,000. And again, you pay it off faster. But the difference is you have a lot less disposable income month to month as you go forward. If you have a 30 year mortgage, your monthly payment is 2684 instead of nearly 4,000. So you got 1300 to play with and live a better standard of living or invest. Your interest over the mortgage is 966 versus 611, but the extra interest is 255, but you pay it off a lot less over that 30 year period. Now let me explain why in this simple little chart. So if you look at this, this is kind of going out to 2030, just nine years, not 15 years or 30 years. But just to illustrate the example, the purchasing power of a million dollars will be worth approximately 470,000, given 8% increase in money supply and the acceleration of that money supply of 15% per year. That is not going to 15%, but that 8% becomes 8 times 1.15. And then that number times 1.15 the next year and so on and so forth. And that brings us down to a 470K and a million dollars. If you have a house, okay, million dollar house, that will be worth 1.885 million at the end of those eight or nine years. But the real value in purchasing power is only 886, but it beats the hell out of the 470K, which is where your million dollars in cash goes to. But think of borrowing that million dollars all you have to do is pay back 470 in real terms. That is the point that I'm trying to get. And another thing as well, we talk about timing of the market. And I'll get back to the answer to your question. So asset purchase timing is very important. And I've been talking about this. I say, you know, Bitcoin leads the market. It falls first. It responds first. It rises first. So crypto fell first. It happened already. Equities second. After last week, we saw many getting smashed. Many are falling into the kill zone. Super, super cheap generational buying opportunity that's happening now. And the third is real estate will fall over the next three to six months because there's a big lag between. So depending on what you want to buy, it's very important to time it correctly. Therefore, you wait. 
If you if you want to buy something now, you buy equities now. And I believe you are short equities. Final example, getting back to the fact that you have your house fully paid off. I know it's expensive to borrow money, but I also know that Tesla's going to do a lot better than 7%, which is the mortgage rate right now. But if you pulled out $100,000 against your house two and a half years ago, and you dropped that into Tesla two and a half years ago, you would now have $1.3 million. And you're only financing 100K at 3%. That's 3,000 a year on 100K to generate 1.3 million for me. Think about that and let that sit in. And I do believe you need more equities. You already have your Bitcoin. It's good. You got your house paid off. Maybe pull a little bit out, stick it into the market. Again, I will always have a mortgage. It's free money. So hope that helps. And uh, next question is from Butcher's Block Oil. Interesting name. Looking to purchase a first castle via a Bitcoin backed loan in order to obtain real estate while keeping a long term Bitcoin position. What are the major risks for those looking to stretch their money in such a manner? So if you came to me a year ago, I'd say, yeah, do it, but never do it for your house. Maybe do it for a small investment or a small bit of cash flow or borrow against your Bitcoin to pay off a high interest rate credit card, etc. Especially if it's free, but there are so many risks. And 2022 was the year that they all became very apparent. First of all, insolvency risk. Deposits are not insured. Not your keys, not your coins. And we all learned the hard way what that means. Second, counterparty risk. Crypto contagion. You don't know what's happening behind closed doors, what they're doing with your crypto, who they're giving it to, who they're lending it to, and how they're lending it. Very, very scary indeed. Third, custody risk. The people holding your crypto could lose your keys. And that's happened too. We all found out as well. It's hard to believe the incompetency and the scams and the criminal behavior of happening beside the seeds. Um, it took us all by surprise. Fourth, regulatory risk. It's not even baked yet. We don't know where this is going. We know that the traditional financial services companies will not be in favor of people borrowing against their crypto because it hurts their business. So we'll see. And fifth, margin call risk. One big wick could wipe you out. So never, ever, ever borrow more than 25% loan to value and watch where the market is. If it's at an all-time high, reduce that to about a fraction of that, a third of 25% as you go forward. And so in summary, I think the space is still too immature, fraught with risk, not enough regulation around it, especially for your primary residence. Do not do it. Very low loan to value is fine for small amounts, but I would not touch it in this market. It is just too risky, too many unknowns. In a year or two, hopefully there'll be more established players behind it, maybe big names, you know, with big brands like the Fidelities of the world. And then uh, we'll be a lot more comfortable going in. But right now, no, be careful, everybody. Uh, Scoobs, 25. My mother-in-law is concerned about the state social care draining away savings that would have been inheritance destined for her disabled son. Since the fiat system is set to get worse and therefore her potential savings might be drained away before it gets to her son, how can we use crypto to circumnavigate the steely hands of the state? <sighs> uh, interesting one. So first of all, this is a prickly subject. There are ways to do things that are very creative. I do not want to share them here because I don't want to expose myself to uh, legal liability or estate planning or anything crazy like that. So... But one thing I would recommend is hire an estate tax planning attorney and it may be best to act now, get the plans in place. And there is ways of, you know, leaving some amounts in a very tax efficient way to uh, her disabled son. And I hope he's OK, by the way. Um, that's the first thing. Second is don't mess with the IRS. I'm going to blow this up. Be careful. Uh, the last thing you ever want to do mess with the tax authorities and they're smarter than you know and they're doubling their force so they're going to be looking under, under the covers for everything including crypto transactions so be careful it's not worth your while to break the law and maybe incur like when we know that things like bitcoin and other things like tesla have a very bright future why not take the tax hit now allocate some money or create some tax-free vehicle uh, and allocate pieces gradually over time to avoid that big headache. And third, uh, depending on the jurisdiction as well, 
there are ways you can buy crypto anonymously. For example, you can pay with cash, etc. And in the USA, there is no law that requires you to report crypto purchases. The problem is when you pass down inheritance to your loved ones, you need to report it because that's the law. And I would still recommend paying an inheritance tax and capital gains tax when you pass them down uh, to her son. Now let's avoid the situation of circumventing the law. Very, very important. And again, it's also very jurisdiction dependent, state dependent, country dependent, etc. There are some very clever things that can be done very easily up in Canada. Uh, check out Quora on that one. You'll get some really cool information. I just don't want to publish it here in case people misinterpret it. And uh, also, um, it may be worth, again, taking the tax hit early, getting a multi-sig crypto solution in place where three parties can actually manage the crypto. Only two need to be aligned. Who knows, Scoops, you can be one of those and help them put it all together. There are some things to do, but it's a prickly subject that I don't want to uh, <laughs> showcase here. But uh, check out some of the resources that are available, especially on Quora. Really, really good articles there. And uh, talk to an estate tax specialist. Critical. Thank you. Next question, Crypto Trillion. As we move closer to a reset, when the U.S. switches to CBDC, how do you think the price of gold will perform? Aha. Uh -huh. Look at me. I'm a gold bug now. <laughs> I do believe. Uh, my theory is programmable money, which is a central bank digital currency, will drive people to unprogrammable money, i.e. hard assets, i.e. gold, where then people want to go analog after, after the digital CBDC is in place. And I do believe there will be huge demand for hard assets right before this comes. In fact, we'll have lots of cases where we can actually watch that happening in real time. For example, I just spoke about Kazakhstan and CZ and what they're going to do. And uh, those uncomfortable with the hardest asset like Bitcoin will choose analog, i.e. gold and silver. And I also believe gold will easily hit, if this does happen, $3,000 by the year 2030. That's my gold price prediction, but that's only 6.9% compound annual growth rate. And because of loss of purchasing power, because gold is denominated in the dollars, here is what that would look like. Current price of gold is, hope I got this right. I, th I threw in 1758, I think it was 1640, but assuming you already got another 6.9% for year end. But here, the key thing to look at, even though the price of gold could go to $3,000 at 6.9% CAGR, that will only have a real purchasing power in dollars of $1,400. So again, I think real estate, leverage real estate, like 20% um, down payment, 80% mortgage will perform better than gold, in my opinion, not financial advice, but you gotta make sure your real estate is in a growing city. Watch the population movements, which we'll talk about next. This one from Polywalk 3000. <laughs> I'm gonna drink some coffee for a second. So, Ray Dalio's Changing World Order uh, video positions the U.S. as a declining power and China as a rising power. What is your perspective on this, including any implications for investing? So this is a prickly one, and there are many, many different uh, perspectives. In fact, some of the people I've been following for a very long time, I've disagreed with over the last couple of weeks around some of their theses. But anyway, let's just throw some data out there. First of all, Ray Dalio is bullish. Peter Zahan is bearish on China. And the, the key thing there is really, uh, you know, birth rate and demographics. So we don't know what the changing order will look like. But from an investing perspective, I do believe the best hedge for all of this would be Bitcoin. But we'll explain why in a second. First, the China issues that I see are as follows. One, huge population challenges. The birth rate is meaning the death rate, and it could go negative. And that is a massive, massive problem. People are not having babies, and people are living a lot longer than ever before. There's also zero dissent against Xi. He's just like a dictator. And uh, we saw that recently happen. And that's never good to grow an economy. Also, zero C-19 policies have been a total failure. It's just absolute stupidity. And that ties back to the second point of zero dissent. These people are just idiotic. But, but it's just because of Xi and his approach. I don't know, maybe their hospitals can't deal with 
the pandemic or whatever, but you can't keep this thing in a sealed jar. Anyhow, f fourth is huge property market problems. And fifth, the semiconductor war that's taking place right now. That's really going to harm the development of things like AI development in China and any other kind of key industries as we go forward. So let's look at investing perspective. So, um, well, we won't talk about Chinese stocks or anything else like that that I've dabbled with in the past. But in the bullish scenario for China, we would see the digital yuan emerge as the global reserve currency. I think that's part of where Ray Dalio is probably going. Now, the dollar would lose its dominance as countries around the world will start to reevaluate the risks of carrying treasuries. And in this scenario, the dollar would weaken and countries would start using the digital yuan for trade, for energy, oil, etc. And we're already seeing these cracks in Saudi Arabia and China as they started talks on trading oil in yuan. And you could also have energy rich countries like Russia trading oil for digital yuan or yuan rubles or their new brick currency. Who knows? It's all going to happen pretty fast, I reckon. And this is how the global reserve currency starts to become weaponized. In this scenario, you would rather be holding Bitcoin because the digital one is basically a spy coin, fully controlled by China. And you've heard me talk about CBTCs long enough, so I won't even go there. But uh, I do believe also people will flock to Bitcoin in order to store their wealth outside the control of China. And the smart, wealthy Chinese that I know are already doing this right now. Now, in the bearish scenario for China, we would see the digital dollar emerge as a global reserve currency. The problem with China is the demographics are terrible. The declining birth rates, as I mentioned, their influence is going to become weaker in the global economy. They could be really crippled by this semiconductor war. And this will allow the US time to develop their own central bank digital currency to replace the dollar. That's coming. Digital dollar, Fed dollar, whatever you want to call it. The problem is they will inevitably run into their own problems with adoption mandating people use their CBDC, even other countries, and people will look for an alternative. And again, as we always say, all roads lead to Bitcoin. Somebody asked me the other day, do you still believe all roads lead to Bitcoin? I haven't heard you say it in a while. I said, yes, <laughs> find me a scenario here. Now, uh, to quote Warren Buffett as well, he said this uh, not too long ago, but he said, in its brief 232 years of existence, there has been no incubator for unleashing human potential like America. Despite some severe interruptions, our country's economic progress has been breathtaking. Our unwavering conclusion, never bet against America. And again, as I say, uh, U.S. has the most entrepreneurial freedom, the venture capital markets, which grow a lot of great businesses. All the top companies in the world today all started by venture capitalists. The top five, the S&P 500, all built on the backs of venture capital. Now, but I do believe all the people that build those companies come from all over the world. So it's just a honeypot that attracts the world's best talent. Look at Elon Musk, he's from South Africa, and etc. So I could go on and give thousands of examples. But like the US dollar is the least dirty shirt, I think the US economy is the most fluid and entrepreneurial. So that's just my take on that. In terms of USA versus China, China is just making too many dumb moves to be able to compete, in my opinion. So maybe I lean more towards Zihan's side on that one. Sorry, Ray Dalio. Thanks for the question. Next question is from 10. Government spending is the main driver for money debasement. Although governments are voted for by the people, too many are dependent on a generous government. Government employees, people on various benefits, health, unemployment, retirement, etc. Do you feel the structure in Switzerland where more power remains with its citizens, is the best way to avoid this trap. Well, yes, I lived in Switzerland for a long time, so I am very familiar with the system there. But sadly, that model will not work in the United States. Because, first of all, Switzerland's too small and too rich. The US is just too large and not rich enough to handle that type of a model. And yes, Entitlements are the issue. Uh, some people call the US a welfare state built on debt. That is a huge problem that we've been talking about. Uh, the Swiss model will not work. And many believe as well, US entitlement programs are broken. Social security will go broke in 2035 or earlier, unless it's funded with more money printing. They say Medicare will go broke in 2028. Uh, the Poor millennials and Gen Zs are the ones kind of funding these things, but never going to be able to pull from them unless, of course, there's more debasement and money printing. 
And again, it's just a QE to infinity, as we've said before. So the entire system is completely unsustainable. The unfunded liabilities are $172 trillion. I could go on and on and on. But uh, the only fix that we see is maybe to figure out a better way, but you can't because I think it all goes back to politicians. Politicians need to stay in office and the majority of people in one way or another are beneficiaries of these programs. So if you cut these programs, you cut your votes and you can, can't be in office. And that's why the whole political system is kind of broken, in my opinion, too. So we have some elections coming up on the 8th of November in the United States. And I think it's going to be, I always see it as a big pendulum swinging. It goes all the way to the left and it goes all the way to the right and it goes all the way to the left. And, you know, that's just how it works. So I do believe it'll be kind of a big red win as well as we go forward. But back to where we are with this and the situation we are in is... Bitcoin. Everybody needs to have a little bit of this because the money printing will continue. It's going to eat away at all purchasing power, which I don't know how many questions I've done today that talk about the same thing. Debasing fiat currency hurts. Find ways to use it to your advantage. Play cleverly. Borrow money. Let it debase. And this is the cycle we're in as well. This uh the stupid cycle, whatever you call it, the death spiral. So we are now in the situation where we have increasing interest rates. We all know about that. We all know what the Fed is doing. We all know, you've heard me say that boxed in, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's okay. We don't talk about that. Even if they do take us into financial Armageddon, which I believe they're going to, that's just going to happen. But they've got to print more money for that financial Armageddon because soon they'll be facing their own trillion dollars in interest servicing, which is Kind of ridiculous. So let me just spell out this scenario. So increasing interest rates will blow up deficits, which will drive asset price declines, which increasing interest rates will also drive job losses, which will also bankrupt businesses. Okay. Now, in result of that, there'll be less federal and state local tax revenue, which means the deficits will get even bigger, which means that either social programs need to be cut or tax rates need to be increased. If you increase tax rates, you reduce funds for private investment or consumption, and you reduce uh, capital market capabilities, etc. It's just, and people will move. People vote with their feet. We've seen that uh, many, many times. And finally, what could happen if they do this? If they do not continue to print money, there could be a sovereign default of debt. And that is the death spiral. <laughs> it's it's as clear as day to me, the sequence of events. And that's what we're in. And that's why I'm ultimately confident money printing will continue. Fiat will continue to debase. Numbers will continue to be fudged. Data will be misinterpreted. There'll be huge lagging indicators, just like the pendulum of, you know, voters going left to right to left to right. We see that in Italy as well happened a few months ago. We're going to see that here in the US again, like we did a few years ago. And that's just the way of the world. We need to find a way to use, sorry for ranting here, I'll get off my soapbox in a minute, more stability, less flip decisions, more long-term planning, like in Switzerland. Everything they do in Switzerland is with a five to 50 year time frame. Even when they build windows, they're not built to last five years. They're built to last 50 years or hundred years. So anyway, <laughs> great questions. Uh, and in happy news, we are helping five little puppies today. Dingo, Caliente, Bosco, Hazel, and Dorian. Big thank you all. You rock. Thank you all for being there. And let's do some questions from the audience. And I hope I didn't go on too long. That was a big one. No, 40 minutes. So let's go. And a big thank you to the team, the moderators, all the beautiful people in the audience. Appreciate you all. So uh, one Brightum, what is the best method of trading? Uh, to make a couple of hundred dollars a day in the market. And what should I be studying? So what I, what I found best is, again, in my life to have extreme focus and have a system that helps you identify. Uh, there's many things you can do. Um, during the summer, I was scalping with uh, different models. I was scalping primarily Bitcoin and Solana. And that was fun. I also was trading options against uh, different assets like MicroStrategy during volatile times. 
especially analyzing the sync between Bitcoin value and MicroStrategy value, which was fun too. Uh, so really, I just uh, focus on that. But remember, paper trade, paper trade, paper trade, till you find a system, you, what I call finding your rhythm, find something you enjoy, find something you're good at, do your homework, build your models, have your spreadsheets, allocate risk appro appropriately, and look for that winning 70 to 80% of the time. A lot of people say you just need to win more than 50% of the time, but even if you win more than 50% of the time, but your losses exceed your gains, you're toast. So I like a much higher win rate, and there's many ways to do that. So uh, I hope that helps. But again, it's possible, but it requires a combination of skills, TA skills, analytical skills, extreme discipline, and learn to read the markets and find that rhythm, which is critical. Mr. Chili's, when Amazon got crushed, I thought Shopify would follow, but it didn't due to earnings, I presume. What do you think has the chance to perform well in two years if we get out of recession? So it's, it's interesting. Amazon is such a view into what's happening with the economy and global recession because they've got markets all over the world. So it's really, really positive. The Shopify earnings did impress. And this is a market where if you miss, even if you beat, even if you beat on revenue, but miss on earnings, or if you forecast that you're not going to have a good quarter next quarter, the market will crush you. But it was good to see that Amazon itself bounced back pretty fast on Friday. Uh, Shopify, I think, will perform much better. And I was actually looking at Shopify, I think around $26. And I decided to buy Meta instead uh, uh, the other day. So that was my decision. But I do believe Shopify versus Amazon. Shopify will win over the next uh, 12 months. It's a kind of a different play. And also... I think what Shopify do very well is they enable small businesses to operate very successfully and they take a piece of their action. So their model is good. Uh, not that it's radically different to Amazon, but Amazon of AWS and they've got the whole logistics infrastructure, etc. whereas Shopify is just pure play software. So from that perspective, Shopify, not financial advice. Um, JKS, uh, do you think Square has any chance to 3X in the next two or three years? I do. I, I have a lot of faith in Jack Dorsey. He's doing some cool things, but he's doing things that I think are... We have this... <laughs> it might be uh, the philanthropist that I'd like to be in me um, out there, but I think he's building things that are for the greater good, kind of like Sam Bankman-Fried, as we discussed today, kind of like Elon Musk. As we go forward, uh, he's coming out with a new um, social network, that's tied into uh, the blockchain. He's building out new mining solutions. The Cash App, Square App, I think has been hurt. But if he can crack the code on using Lightning for payments and with all the retailers he has on the Square platform, I think that could be a game changer. And I think once we go risk on, people will start to see the work he's doing. He's been very quiet, very heads down, but what he's building is quite special. Uh, also, remember, he has friends in high places, um, and there could be, who knows, a collaboration between something that Square do and Twitter do under Elon Musk, because they both believe crypto will be a big part of both platforms. That's a powerful synergy, and that's something I'm looking forward to. So, Elon, if you're listening, call Jack Dorsey. Do it. Okay. So, with that, Charles King Cannon um, is there a time to sell GBTC and buy Bitcoin in case regulations adversely affect GBTC? The GBTC thing has been a mystery. Uh, I don't know. Last time I looked, the discount was 35%. Right now, it's 36.13%. It looks like it bottoms at 36%, and that's as far down as it goes. Um, I think with that type of discount and the fact that they do have... Bitcoin backing their fund. I think they'll just struggle down there. I don't think there's any more downside. If it hit 40%, I'd be very, very surprised, which is only 4% away. But once we go risk on again, people will look for on ramps to Bitcoin and the demand for GBTC could come. The problem is there's simply no demand. Nobody is buying it. Uh, and that is the issue. It's, it's, it's equivalent to the quietness in the market as well for Bitcoin. 
In fact, yeah, Bitcoin, 20,700. Super quiet, quiet and flat. Had a big bounce on Friday night and then quiet. So uh, we'll see. Um, in terms of selling it to buy, you're just not going to get much bang for your buck. So it's like you're kind of nearly in too deep. And I get the question about should people sell GBTC from MicroStrategy? Only if you can trade it. So G MicroStrategy is super volatile, and that makes it a lot of fun to trade and scalp uh, if you have that type of discipline. So that's what I'd say there. But in terms of regulations, it's only a matter of time before the ETF is approved, but that may not happen until late 2023 at this stage. Um, so we'll see. Our Ahmed, uh, thoughts on Sam Bankman frieds aim to become crypto BlackRock? He already is. <laughs> like between him and CZ, they own the, they own the world. Um, if you look at the amount of activity and revenue, um, and people are always focused on Sam Bankman fried but keep a close eye on CZ because he does so much and uh, so much more, especially if they're getting into running central bank digital currencies on the Binance chain. That's like, whoa, strange, because, you know, if Kazakhstan do it, how many other countries will follow their lead? And every, everybody, I always talk about the nuclear arms race to get that spy coin in place in all the countries. It's the best way to manage people and control people going forward. So I sound like a proponent of central bank digital currencies. And of course, I'm not. So uh, I don't think I think I honestly do believe SBF has the best interest of the world there. Um, BlackRock, I'm not sure. I think they just serve their big high net worth customers. AG, are you concerned about Sol's diminishing TVL? No, nope. actually, this morning I was reading up on a lot of other stuff in terms of value transfer, active wallets, etc., transactions per day, daily active users. That's all good. Solana never had good TVL because they don't incentivize people to drop a lot of coin there compared to other chains. So they've always, always been weak in TVL. Therefore, I am not concerned. JKS, will MicroStrategy run faster than Bitcoin? If Bitcoin 2x is could MicroStrategy 2.5 or 3x? Uh, it's not what the benefit of owning MicroStrategy rather than BTC. Um, so MicroStrategy is purely a levered play in a safe way where you can find really cool arbitrage opportunities. That's always been my play. When there are things like short squeezes, you get massive pumps in MicroStrategy that go way, way beyond uh, the Bitcoin price action. Last week, I think Bitcoin went up 1.9% in a day in a 24-hour period. MicroStrategy went up 10%. And that is just <laughs> incredible. We saw it going from like 200 to 260 in a couple of days, I think, or 250, 240. I can't remember exactly the numbers. So it's far more volatile. And MicroStrategy is a perfect beast by which to trade. If you are a trader, that's the benefit. Uh, but as I always say, if you just want to hold, buy and hold, pure form, Bitcoin is always the safest play. Um, typically, people like me, people that ARB stuff, they'll always find a way to bring the price back to the equilibrium. The wild card for MicroStrategy is the fact that if you look at the debt that they have versus the amount of Bitcoin that they have and the fact that they're underwater, once Bitcoin goes above 30K again and they get out of their hole, that will change the game for MicroStrategy. That will build the intrinsic value of the business up a lot and it'll bring more money into it. And therefore, you'd easily get a 2.5x or 3x uh, while Bitcoin only does a 2x. So putting that into language, Bitcoin's at 20K now, goes to 30K, and MicroStrategy could easily go to 500. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, and go back and look at the historical charts and create the uh, Bitcoin MicroStrategy pair or MicroStrategy Bitcoin pair and look at the pricing action. It's fascinating. Alexander Budd, uh, hello. Save, save the animals, save the world. It's theirs too. It is indeed. Thank you so much. And Mike, long-term holder. Love you, man. For our friendly friends, happy Sunday. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And Bombiggy, you rock. We have lots of furry friends and we were able to help five today. So thank you, everybody. And Super Six is KN Dog One AC One and Michael Combatant. Thank you, everybody. Happy Sunday. Go outside and spend some time with your loved ones. And I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye.